Hi, I'm Nicholas Fernandez. I'm a computational scientist at the Human Immune Monitoring Center at Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. And um, I'll be talking about high dimensional data visualization with Cluster Grammar 2. And thank you to the organizers for letting us present. So, as an overview, we'll start off with some thoughts on data visualization in general. Then we'll discuss our Python library, Cluster Grammar 2, which is also a Jupyter interactive widget. And then we'll go through some case studies to explain how we can use um, our library to explore uh, a wide variety of different data sets and how we can integrate that with other visualization and analysis tools. Okay, so our primary motivation is to visualize and understand biological data, um, but we're building tools to, to be generalizable enough for any kind of data. But um, one of Difficulty with biological data is it can be very difficult to visualize and it can lead to what um, was referred to previously as like hair balls where you have these, these big interaction networks in, in biological systems that if you just try and visualize all the connections, you end up with this incomprehensible hairball. In this case, we're trying to visualize um, a set of protein-protein interactions between um, about 10,000 proteins. So, so it's a biologically meaningful thing to visualize, but if we attempt to visualize it using this ball and stick approach, it kind of devolves into something that's, that's really incomprehensible. And one of the reasons that biological data is difficult to visualize is because it can be very, very high dimensional, meaning that each one of your samples, you're measuring um, potentially thousands of things about that sample. So your dimensionality is, is your thousands of, thousands of dimensions in, in space, if you think of it. So it's really, really huge spaces that you're working with. So for instance, in uh, RNA-seq or proteomics, you can measure every um, gene in, the, in a cell. So it can be like 20 to 30,000 genes or and gene variants that you're measuring. Um, and that can be in, in hundreds of samples, potentially in flow cytometry and cytops. You can measure maybe 50 or so proteins, but if you're measuring those in hundreds of thousands to millions of cells. So it's a, kind of a, a, a bigger data set in the samples um, size. And then some of the newer data sets like single cell RNA-seq, site-seq, and some of the spatial data sets, um, those kind of combine everything where you measure tens of thousands of dimensions and you have tens of thousands to millions of samples. And uh, some of the newer techniques, you can even measure the actual physical spatial location of uh, single cells in a tissue. So not only do you have these um, this, uh, your cells in really high dimensional gene expression space, for instance, you also know where they are in the tissue. And uh, it can lead to a lot of complexity when you try and analyze this data. So um, one very popular technique in, um, in data analysis and data visualization is the use of dimensionality reduction. So dimensionality reduction is, is very powerful and it's useful uh, well beyond just data visualization. But in the context of data visualization, the idea is that you take something that's in a very high dimensional space, it's, it's very difficult to reason about, and you um, find ways that you can reduce the dimensionality and sort of project your data down to two or three dimensions usually, and then you can visualize it directly like in a scatterplot approach. Um, so three very popular techniques um, that are used for that are PCA, TISNI, and UMAP. Um, and on the right here, we're looking at a dimensionality reduction uh, visualization of a very popular data set called the MNIST data set, which consists of handwritten digits. Um, so each, in this data set, it's um, thousands of handwritten digits, and the idea is that you want to use different computational techniques to find structure in that data and see if you can, in an unbiased manner, classify those digits. So um, what's shown here is that you're using TISNI to um, visualize this high-dimensional data um, as uh, a scatter plot. And um, so it's actually it's an image, but if you think of each pixel as a dimension, this each image is actually uh, living in a 700-dimensional space. You can think of it. So, um, and what you can do is run TISNI to do dimensional reduction and project that down to two dimensions. And then if you color each digit based on its identity, you actually see that it does a really remarkably good job of uh, unbiasedly putting um, images that are actually the same number near each other. So it does a very good job of mapping it down. But the difficulty in general with these techniques is they can be difficult to interpret, meaning that you know two data points or several data points are very similar to each other, but this visual in and of itself doesn't tell you why. So you, you have to go to your underlying data to understand that uh, a little bit better. And okay, so an alternative data visualization technique, kind of an older technique, of course, is uh, the, the use of tables and spreadsheets, right? So, um, and the power of these techniques is that they um, you, you, you technically can visualize very high dimensional data. Yeah, if you think of your samples as your columns, let's say, and your rows as your dimensions, and in this case, you have a very simple 
expense sheet where we have our data points, our months, and our dimensions, our different expenses. And we can see the breakdown of expenses across different three different dimensions. But we could easily scale this to thousands of dimensions and thousands of data points in this Excel sheet. Um, so it's, it's incredibly interpretable. Like we can see exactly what's happening. We can see every number with as many digits, as, as, uh, as much accuracy as we want to. But the problem is it's not really very visually appealing. And it takes a long time to sort of visually process the information because you need to look at each number. Uh, so what, it's very accurate and very interpretable, but visually unappealing. So one trick we can do is it, it this table has a lot of strengths, right? But uh, in order to make it more appealing, we can the trick we can use is that we just replace the numbers with colors and then you get a heat map. And then kind of like in a sort of mind blown moment, you're like, you've gotten something that now is visually appealing and lets you directly interrogate really high dimensional spaces. And uh, so that's the sort of inherent um, strength of the approach of heat maps or cluster rams. And then the next trick you can do is you can control the order of um, your data points and your dimensions. And you can uh, arrange them in such a way where similar data points and similar dimensions are, are put near each other. So in this case, we have, uh, this is some gene expression data where we have our samples as rows and our dimensions as columns. And we performed hierarchical clustering to arrange similar dimensions and similar samples near each other. So we can now see structure in the data. You can see all these samples are high for these genes and these are low for these genes. And then we can see clusters of our, dim of our dimensions and clusters of our samples. So it's, it's a very powerful technique. And then we can also visualize the hierarchical clustering using what's called a dendrogram here. So you can see the relationship between how similar these data these um, dimensions are and how similar the samples are. But uh, again, the problem you run into here is it's these static heat maps, like this actual static image doesn't scale well in terms of the number of data points or the number of samples or the number of dimensions. So as you just keep adding more data into it, you can see the structure, but you it, like everything becomes so small that you it's not no longer manageable, no longer readable. And you kind of, it becomes uh, a lot less useful. So this was sort of the driver behind the cluster grammar project. We really liked the idea of using heat maps to integrate this complicated data, um, but we really wanted to build some. We wanted to build something that could scale up, and it was a lot more user friendly. So we wanted something that allowed interactive data exploration, was very user friendly and shareable, scaled to large data sets, and we chose the Jupyter environment and the Python ecosystem to work in. And um, it's, and we'll we'll touch on some of the strengths of the Jupyter widget environment, um, and then. As an overview, our, our, our cluster grammar heat map allows you to, to visualize the data in a clustered form. You can reorder it. You can select uh, subsets of your data. You can zoom, filter, um, perform a lot of different operations. And then one of the things we've been doing lately is, is sort of trying to, to bridge both, both approaches and build views where you can have a dimensionally reduced view on the one hand and a heat map view, and you can kind of relate the two to each other and interact with one and have that data pass back and forth. So to sort of understand how like related these two views are and kind of use the strengths um, to sort of shore each other up. Um, okay, and uh, like I mentioned before, the Jupyter, um, probably a lot of you are familiar with it, but some of the strengths of the Jupyter platform are that you can run analysis locally, you can share that on the web, you can even run it on the web using cloud uh, platforms like MyBinder, CodeOcean, Saturn Cloud, uh, AWS SageMaker, uh, Google Colab. There's a lot of options out there. And, um, and we'll even be touching base on a non Jupyter cloud based uh, notebook environment called Observable at the end of the talk. Um, okay, so the original cluster grammar was built using a library called Data Driven Documents, which is a very powerful data visualization library. Um, but the, the um, the problem with it is it doesn't scale up to the data sizes that we want with some of the more like the newer single cell data sets we have. So you kind of are capped out maybe a maximum of like around 20,000 data points and then it starts to become too slow. So for the second iteration of Cluster Grammar, Cluster Grammar 2, we built it using WebGL. So WebGL uses the computer's um, graphical processing unit, um, basically what you can use for video games to sp speed up the processing of uh, data data visualization. So now we can scale to over a million data points. And we chose to use the WebGL library called uh, Regal. And OK, so now we're going to go over about um, four different case studies. We're going to start off with a non-biological data set um, from CityBike. And then we're going to touch base on a single cell data set, a spatial data set, and some, some new COVID data sets and show you how, um, how we can use cluster grammar for these, the, the wide variety of data. So our first example, um, we decided we wanted to visualize city bike 
um, data from uh, New York City. And we uh, this data is publicly available at uh, Citibike um, under their data sharing. So we took 2.18 million rides from the month of July in 2019. And these rides occurred across 787 stations across the city. So we wanted to see, could we, um, in an unbiased manner, cluster stations based on their connectivity of like, if you're at one station, what stations are you going to go to next and then perform unbiased clustering there? And, um, and it could be visualized that using cluster grammar. So we went ahead and, and built a notebook and then we use the library uh, voila to build a dashboard from that notebook and we're running this dashboard locally for for here but we can this can also be run on uh, my binder and uh, we have links for that so in this view we're we have all the um city by stations the 787 stations shown across the city and if you're familiar um with breakdown of the city you can see manhattan here uh queens brooklyn so these are all the different stations and the same stations are shown here in the C-map. So the 787 stations, we, we are viewing the connectivity of the stations such that you have your starting station as your column and your destination station as your row. So if you, we went ahead and calculated the probability distribution of if you're at one station, where are you most likely to go to next? And then clustered um, both the arriving and um, the, the leaving and departing uh, stations in to, to find clusters within these the stations and to see if if you could find clusters of those stations of like highly connected stations. And what you actually see is that there's a ton of structure in the data set. So if we zoom in here, we can see we um, the connectivity between specific stations. So if you mouse over here, you can see the actual cross streets of the, of the station. And if you mouse over, we've given a sort of tentative um, neighborhood. So if you click, um, this is Queens. And then you can see these different stations are highly connected to other stations in Queens. So um, there's a, a lot of structure in the data and you can sort of easily start to, to determine little structures within the city. So if we use our interactive dendrogram, we can take slices of different levels. So at a very high level, we can break the city down into like three groups. So if we click over here, we see we have upper Manhattan. If you click here, lower Manhattan. And then the third really high level group is uh, Queens of Brooklyn. Uh, but you can take that down into much more granularity and you can find little sub neighborhoods. So if you click here, you'll find um, the section of Brooklyn. If you go over here into lower Manhattan, you'll find this uh, sort of like the battery section of Manhattan and up um, like the lower west side. So you, so you can see that these neighborhoods are like highly connected. Like effectively, people tend to stick within their own neighborhood um, based on uh, the city bike uh, and uh, probability distributions. So we're taking this data set that doesn't necessarily seem like it would be high dimensional data, but we're visualizing it in 700 87 dimensions. And we're basically able to use cluster grammar to see all 787 dimensions simultaneously and be able to interpret where these stations are on the physical map here. So we can, one thing we've added in is if you click a station row here, you can highlight that station in black and it will show you where the rides are coming from to arrive at that station. So where, where the inbound stations are. And then, so if you click over here, in lower, uh, lower Manhattan, you can see different stations and you can see where people are coming from to that station. And then we added in the functionality where if you click the station, it will toggle it between inbound and outbound views. So it's a fun data set to work with um, to, to visualize different, different patterns in the, in the stations and, and sort of in an unbiased manner, identify uh, little clusters of stations and sort of see little anomalies that are happening where sort of neighborhoods kind of crisscross. Um, and then what's... Um, Visually, what's interesting is that you can, these stations are mapped out in physical space, but we can also say we want to visualize each of these stations and we, we would like to instead transform it into uh, dimensionality reduced space. So we built a little toggle switch here where you can have actual physical location and the UMAP location. So if we click this UMAP button, it transfers it to a UMAP representation of the data. And now we have, like what we mentioned, alluded to earlier, we have a UMAP of our high dimensional data points and we have a heat map of the data points. And once again, we can find clusters here and highlight them in the UMAP. So you can see the relationship of clusters you find in the hierarchical clustering and how they're recapitulated in this uh, UMAP representation. Um, so by combining the, these two views, we're able to sort of better understand our data and, and, and find like really robust clusters that are not um, dependent on, on one particular clustering method. And then one, one last thing to, to kind of, that's interesting is if you 
go look at the physical location here, you'll notice that, that despite the fact that uh, Midtown and Lower Manhattan are, are located right next to each other, and on the UMAP, they actually get split apart here. And the uh, Manhattan is really mostly connected along um, the west side. And that's because there's a, a highly used west side, west side um, bike highway that, um, that a lot of commuters use. So that's, from a connectivity standpoint, Manhattan's really connected much more along the west side than it is here, despite the fact that you have a lot of space for it to be connected here. So you can start to understand the patterns of traffic and um, find different neighborhoods and this kind of thing. So, so we think it's a really a, a fun a fun approach, a fun data set to work with, with these, these data visualization approaches. Um, okay, so our next example, we'll move on to a biological example. And we're actually gonna use a lot of the same techniques that we use on the city bike example. So for this data set, we're visualizing um, data that we, is, is from a publication where we worked with our collaborators in the uh, Gian, Gianarelli lab at uh, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And uh, our work was recently published in uh, Nature Medicine. Um, in 2019. So for this data set, we um, investigated the immune landscape of human atherosclerotic plaques, and in, we built a dashboard for a subset of the data that includes over 5,000 single cells. And in those cells, we measure 21 protein markers and over 30,000 genes. And we're going ahead and, and, and visualizing the most um, variable genes across that data set and all protein markers. So for this dashboard, you'll notice there's, um, this dashboard is also available um, on my binder. But you'll notice there's a lot of similarities between the city bike example and this data set. So we have um, UMAP representation and uh, representation of our data. Except here, um, our columns and our rows are different. So, um, and, and also the important thing to note is that underneath this is it just a plain old Jupyter notebook. It's just we're converting to a dashboard using this Voila dash, dashboard library. And you can you can find the Jupyter notebook on our GitHub page. So, um, so for this data set, uh, it's a little bit different. We have our single cells, those columns here. So if you zoom in, you can see the actual um, barcode, the oligo barcode. And if you're familiar with um, 10x genomics um, data sets, you'll recognize that, that type of barcode. So each, each barcode is a unique identifier of a cell. And each cell, we're visualizing the top 100 variable genes. So the genes are shown in gray and we're measuring 21 proteins simultaneously. So you can think of these as independent data sets that we're mixing together. So um, based, basically you can go through and based on the expression of a particular protein or a particular gene, you can start to understand what cell type you're working with. So for instance, here, um, if you click the dendrogram here, you can see that this set of um, cells are predicted to be B cells. And then if you click it here, you can see this is where these B cells show up on the UMAP. Um, and if you zoom in, so for instance, in the UMAP here, you can see, okay, all these are meant to be um, a similar cell type, but we don't know what the mechanism of, like why they're, they're meant to be, this, what, what makes them similar to the, each other and what makes them dissimilar to other cells. But using the heat map, you can zoom in and start to see, okay, the, the sort of signifying, or the, the main thing that characterizes these is the high expression of these proteins, like CD19, uh, CD24, and these genes, like these HLA, DRA, C74, and um, we also have um, a component where you can hover over a gene name and it will talk to an API from, uh, called the Harmonizome uh, from the Abimayon group. And it will grab the full name of that gene and a little uh, ref seek description to just help you understand a little bit better the, the biology that's happening. So here we're, we're showing that we're, we're getting really good clustering in this dimension I reduce space. And then here the heat map is helping us um, uh, understand the mechanism of that clustering. So basically they're high for these genes or low for these genes high for these genes. So we can start to understand what's happening and then we can even click the road dendrogram here and uh, select all the genes and take those genes to another tool for some other data analysis if we wanted to. And um, for instance, if we wanted to pick a different cell, we could double click a cell and then reorder the expression of all genes based on that single cell and start to identify different patterns in our data. And um, so one of the, the other key components to our data visualization approach is that we, we really want to integrate um, uh, data-driven clustering. So the actual, like the, the structures you're finding here in this, in this heat map and our prior knowledge or, or labeling that we've done. So this data actually consists of cells from um, uh, blood, from PBMCs from blood, and then also cells from atherosclerotic plaques. So we've added those, those labels to the, to the data set. So if you click here, you can see where those cells fall on the, on the UMAP. But then we can also, we've also assigned a, a cell type prediction so you can click and see where cells of a particular cell type are located. 
So we're able to layer on multiple levels of, of uh, basically metadata on each cell and see the relationship between unbiased clustering and the breakdown of the, in this particular cluster, what are the breakdown of the different categories and this can help us under interpret what's happening in our data. And like, for instance, if a cluster is enriched for a particular cell type. And then um, one last thing we'll, we'll just touch base on is the fact that we, in this case, we happen to have like two different data sets co-mingle, but we can run the UMAP on the merge of the data sets. We can also run the UMAP on different data sets, different subsets. So if we run it just based on protein levels or what was referred to as ADTs, we get this representation. We can also run the UMAP based on gene expression alone and see this other representation. So there's a um, interactivity just adds a, uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of understanding and exploring these data sets. Um, okay, so the next example we'll quickly go over is an example of how we can use cluster grammar to annotate some um, unlabeled data. So in this data set, we're looking, uh, it's, it's referred to as a site-seek uh, data set where you're basically, similarly to the last data set we showed, we're, we're measuring 7,800 single cells, we're measuring 14 proteins and over 30,000 genes, and we're gonna demonstrate how we can create two different linked views of the cells in those two different data sets. And um, in an uh, in actual Jupyter lab instance, and go through and, and annotate those cells. So we start off with, we have two different pandas data frames. So we've got protein, uh, 14 proteins and 7,865 cells. And then here we have 30,000 genes and 7,865 7, cells. So we went ahead and used cluster grammar to visualize the protein space here. So you can see there's a lot of structure in our data. And then here we visualize the gene expression space in the top 100 variable genes. So this is the same data, but it's, it's two independent data two independent measurements of exactly the same cell. So it's kind of a, a unique data set to work with. So we start off by having everything unlabeled as unidentified, but we can go through and start to identify some cell types. We can say CD19, high cells here, we can go through and start to type in B cell, click B cell, and we've labeled our B cells. Now what's really nice about the widgets framework is you can link things together. So now we've that labeling has gotten transferred to this other widget. So now we can see here are the same B cells, but here they are in a different space, the gene expression space. And now we can find like different subsets within that space. We can say this subset has this gene really highly expressed and it can it basically, this is a much higher dimensional space. So we can find relationships that we may not find in the protein space, for instance. And then we can do the converse and we can say, okay, this cluster of cells is really highly expressing these genes, so we can see um, like granzyme H. So we can basically say, okay, perhaps these are uh, NK cells. So we can say NK, um, set the category on that. And then now we color them this color. And now if you scroll back up, the um, label has transferred over here. So now you can say, this is where these cells fall in this space. And then what's cool is that we're linking this up to a single data frame of metadata. So we start off with everything unidentified. But if we re-execute this, we see these. this data frame is actually listening to both heat maps. So we've labeled two different widgets that are labeling the same data frame. And then we can just go ahead and save this as metadata. And now we've in a, we've basically gone through and manually annotated some data. So we're, we're kind of like closing the loop on how you can bring in prior knowledge and, and label your data, and there, there's a lot of uh, potential with this, these approaches. Um, okay, we'll quickly touch base on a spatial data set from uh, mouse brain transcriptomics. Um, so this is an interesting data set where it basically took a mouse brain, put on a slide, and they're using a technique called um, Visium from 10 x Genomics, so this data is publicly available. And they're measuring, uh, it's not quite single cell resolution, but they're measuring 5,000 spots on the slide. Each spot contains one to 10 cells and you're measuring 30,000 genes. Uh, and so what we went ahead and did was we took a, a previously labeled data set, used that to generate signatures of cell type, and then transfer that label onto this data set, and then built, a, once again, a dashboard to work with this data. Um, so again, you'll see uh, a lot of similarities in the approaches. So, but, what's, but similarly to the uh, city bike example, we actually know the physical location of these. Like Each of these spots is a region of the actual mouse brain. Um, and the color is the predicted cell type for that mouse brain. Um, so we're looking at the cells, the spots here. Uh, we'll, we might refer to them as cells also, but we have our cells here as columns and our genes as dimensions. So we can go ahead and like click on a particular gene and see the expression of that gene in the spatial orientation. So you can see if you zoom in here, all of these genes are uh, gonna be highly expressed in that kind of like middle region of the brain. 
Um, so there's a, like, not only are the genes, not only can you think of it in this really high dimensional uh, data space, but you can also visualize the data in this actual real world space. So you can see there's a lot of really interesting patterns in the data that mirror the cell type uh, predictions. And then you can do stuff similarly what we did with the city bike, where you can go in and say, show me, you know, two broad neighborhoods in the in this brain. So if you had to break the brain into two parts, you could break it into this one and this part. But of course, you could go a lot smaller than that, and you can find different regions of um, of these these spots. So what's 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 cool is that these spots are phenotypically similar based on the expression of these different genes, and they just so happen to be located in the same physical space. So this shows you there's a lot of concordance between gene expression and physical location. And then once again, we can take these data points and we can transfer them to a UMAP. So it shows you the relationship. If you're some data sets, you're lucky to actually have physical location. You can see how that physical location relates. Uh, based on the dimensionality reduced approach uh, in the heat map. And then one, you, you can do the same trick where you, you click on a row and see that in the dimensionality reduced space. Um, so that's another fun example. Um, okay. And then here uh, we'll, we'll quickly touch base on um, some COVID data from uh, that we're using a platform called Observable to visualize. So in this case, this is a data set. We, we work with some collaborators to help um, review the, the rush of uh, literature for, for COVID um, that's been coming out recently since uh, January of uh, 2020. So basically, we, we built this um, this dashboard to help reviewers keep track of the literature. So this shows you the number of papers coming out per day. Uh, and you can see there's already over 5,000 publications. And we're integrating um, reviews from expert uh, immunologists at, um, at Mount Sinai. But we also added in an unbiased data visualization of the papers themselves based on the most common words. So you can actually zoom in. We have papers as columns and the most common terms as rows. So this shows how we can visualize like a different type of data set in cluster grammar. So you can see these papers, they all share words like acute, severe, viral, virus, human identified. And um, so it was kind of just seeing if there's any structure here, but you can clearly see there's different clusters of papers. And what's also interesting is that the journal Papers from BioArchive cluster very differently than papers from MedArchive. And then also the reviewers have gone ahead and annotated the, the ones with the most immunological relevance, and you can see those also cluster based on their common terms and their abstracts. Um, and then lastly here, we're visualizing some gene expression data from some uh, um, lung cell lines from the um, 10 overlap, uh, where they recently released some data. So they basically infected some lung cancer cell lines with uh, COVID, and they uh, to release the differentially expressed genes. So we clustered that in Python and then put it on GitHub and are reading it from Observable. And what's nice is that you can, so over here you have COVID infection and um, uh, mock infection, so non-infection. So you, you can go ahead and rank the genes based on the most, um, if you look at one sample and then you can see these are the upregulated genes, you can click here. Um, and then we can basically run enrichment analysis and start to understand the biological functions associated with these different genes. So now you can see like uh, all these are, let's say, uh, interferon pathways. So you can click here and see the gene and it will bring up information for you. So it's a very flexible path uh, platform that also allows you to um, go beyond just working in the Python ecosystem as well. But it sort of modularly works with across different platforms. So the, the uh, original cluster grammar was, was a... Um, previously published in the Nature Scientific Data. We're, we're working on a manuscript for Cluster Grammar 2. Um, all of our, our code and examples are available on GitHub, and we have a documentation page. And uh, we would just like to acknowledge uh, everyone at the Human Immune Monitoring Center that, that's helped out. Um, everyone in my uh, previous lab where I was, did a postdoc and developed the original Cluster Grammar in the Myon lab, and uh, our collaborators in the John Arelli lab. And um, finally, all the open source developers working on all these really amazing open source projects and uh, without which none of this would be possible. And uh, thank you for your time.